service this morning. Let's all stand. Come, Christians, join the same page 9-0, standing as we say.
choir comes down, let's all stand, turn to page eight. Page eight, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Page eight, standing as we say. today. Um, remember, of course, this week's spring break here at the school, so office uh, hours be a little bit uh, modified because of that. Uh, but, of course, I think if you really need one of us, our cell phones are out there. Our cell phone numbers are there, so you can, can reach us. We'll be busy, though. We've got a full week ahead of us and excited about uh, uh, everything. I hope that you'll plan uh, to be here Wednesday nights, we kick off our spring and summer uh, outreach, uh, Wednesday night outreach uh, ministry. Not that we haven't been uh, visiting with people and so on through the winter months, but uh, we begin our organized outreach. It'll be this Wednesday at 545, and so I hope to have a good group out for that. We'll meet uh, a few moments there before the evening service. Uh, this this Wednesday, so I hope you'll be here for that. Also, want to remind our church family that we will be partaking of the Lord's Supper this Wednesday, as we remember our Lord's death till He come. And so we'll do that this Wednesday uh, evening. So be prepared for that, and hope that hope that you'll be here for it. And then, of course, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Please uh, invite people to be here to join you, uh, gather with us. I will get this out on our social media page uh, probably today. So if you want to share that uh, or copy it and paste it, however you do that, that'll be fine. And the choir's working on uh, special, some special music, and so it'll be a special day. Uh, every Sunday's a, a wonderful and a special day, but yeah. next Sunday's in particular a, a wonderful day to, to invite people. Easier to get people in church on, on the, the, the Sunday near Christmas and, and uh, of course, uh, Resurrection Sunday. So I hope you'll, you'll be inviting people to be here. Uh, next month, uh, beginning a week from tomorrow, will be our ladies' uh, Bible study series through First Thessalonians. That'll be on Monday evenings here at the church at six, from 6.30 to 7.30, first four Mondays of April. See on the bulletin board in the hallway, ladies, if you're planning to be here for that, please get signed up for it so Andrea can have the materials ready uh, to teach that. Uh, she's been working hard on that, so you'll, you will enjoy it, and, and I hope that you'll make a point to be here. If you've got to miss one of those, I, I'm sure that uh, that would be okay. But obviously, if you can commit to all of them, that would be best uh, for you. You get the most most out of the study. So, hope you'll plan to do that. All right, my dad or Pastor Maris will come and receive our offering this morning.
Well, it's good to be here. Nice sunshine. I always appreciate this time of year. We had a great Sunday school. And uh, Brother Lockhart, what a blessing. Thank you so much for being here. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, that's pretty uh, identifying, isn't it? So uh, we need, uh, and you spoke to us about our thoughts today. And we sang that, uh, that last uh, uh, congregational hymn, and <laughs> it was page eight. I was singing page seven. <laughs> I didn't realize until we got to the second verse, I thought, what's Greg singing? <laughs> yeah, it's not. <laughs> so. I don't know what you were singing, but I was having a good time. <laughs> All right, let's have the ushers come. We'll honor the Lord with our tithes and offerings. By the way, watch the song later, you'll uh, and listen. <laughs> okay. Pastor Brent, you thank the Lord for the offering. Uh, Lord, have moody thank you for uh, this day that you gave us, Lord. Bring us here safe to church to worship you. Lord, we do ask that you do bless your word as it's preached today and help us to apply the truth that we hear from you. And we do pray that you bless us often, Lord, bless the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Luke chapter 19. In your Bible this morning, Luke chapter 19. When you found it, if you're able and willing, please, would you stand me, stand with me out of respect for the scriptures. Luke chapter 19. We're going to pick it up in 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, To return over us. It came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Father, help us. We pray. We ask today. Lord, I request that you would wash me and cleanse me. Word go forth in great power today. May it, it speak to the, the heart, mind of each one that hears today. And then, Lord, give us the faith to respond to you in obedience as you would desire. Again, Lord, we ask that the lost would be saved. It's our desire, the wayward would be made right, and Lord, that the faithful would be encouraged and built up in the faith. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Today is, of course, we've already mentioned, we remember the what we call the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Uh, this is a week before he laid down his life uh, for us. And upon that entry, the crowd was crying out that uh, he would, Hosanna, that he would, he would give the victory, that he would set up his kingdom, and that's what, that's what they, they desired. They desired a, someone that would give the victory over their oppressors. Uh, Hosanna means uh, victory now or give the victory now. And uh, Later in this chapter, it's uh, penned a little bit different way. Uh, there's a, a desire that, that God would, would take over, that, that uh, the Messiah, they, they thought, was going to come and, and reign and, and re release them from this oppression that they, they were under. They had, they had missed the message that Christ continually stated that, that now was not the time for him to be, to be the king on the earth. He, he came the first time to lay down his life of sacrifice for us. Aren't you thankful he is? he's coming to, to be king? set up his millennial reign and we are studying some of that about that that time uh, prophetic time time still to come in our Wednesday night series in the book of Revelation but this parable that I want us to look at today is right before uh, the triumphal entry and it, it, it follows right after the winning of Zacchaeus now, Zacchaeus was saved is recorded for us in the preceding verses makes a, a simple statement here in verse 10 that, that ties, ties into the, the parable of the pounds that we'll see today. So, so Zacchaeus, who would have been despised by everybody, he was, a, he was known as a, a cheat, a tax collector, and uh, they, they got wealthy by uh, escalating the taxes of others. In fact, when Zacchaeus got right with God, he restored it to those he'd stolen from. That's right. Multiple times, multiple fold. But we see here in verse 10 this very simple and succinct statement. I thought about this particular point before, but every word in this statement is a syllable. Simple. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the ministry of Christ. It's the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. It's the redemption of lost souls. To seek and to say. He came to, to die for us. Amen. So we remember this very special week, this, 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 this road to Calvary. Uh, and we'll, we're, we'll celebrate and remember these things today, uh, Wednesday, next Sunday. Uh, the, the cross upon which our Lord and Savior gave himself is substitutionary death for us. I want us on this Palm Sunday to note a very particular lesson that our Lord taught in this parable in these few days before he departed. It's centered around this command that we see in verse 13. Would you notice there? At the end of the verse, it says, Occupy till I come. We'll look at that word in a little bit of more detail later in the message, but it means to, to be about the Lord's business. Stay at the task that he's given us to do. My question, the question I'd like for you to consider in your mind and answer today is this. What are you doing with the pound that God has entrusted to you. We're going to look at it today, but I want us to think about what is it that I am doing with the pound that God has entrusted to me. You see, the, the nobleman in our story is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave to each of these ten servants a pound. And we'll look at what that means but the, the point that we need to see today, if we're going to make the Bible real to us, and by the way, as you read it, you should, is what is it, what am I doing with that that God has entrusted to me? What are you doing with the pound that God has given to you? Let's know, first of all, the characters here in this parable. By the way, it's, it, don't miss this. Things he added and spake a parable. So what had they just heard? They, they'd heard about Zacchaeus being saved and God accepting him. That he could be saved. And that he had, he'd gotten, he'd gotten re redeemed, he'd gotten saved, and it changed his life. There was evidence of his redemption by yeah. his conduct, right? And then Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And those that continued listening, he, he went a little further, he did some more teaching. He, he's, he's telling them again that... I'm going to leave for a while. Now it's not time for me to set up my kingdom here. But I have a task for you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Occupy till I come. The nobleman, the nobleman represents to die. He came to give himself for our sin. He came to provide redemption through his shed blood on Calvary's cross. Christ has never sinned, never will sin. He shed his innocent blood for you and for me. He gave himself for you. He gave himself for me. He came to conquer sin and death. Oh, next Sunday is coming. We're going to celebrate the fact that when uh, they went to visit his tomb, tried to honor, pay some more respects, they got there, the stone was already rolled away. They didn't know who was going to roll the stone away so they could go in and, 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 and uh, honor him and, and uh, with spices and so on, but the stone was rolled away. He was gone. Why? Because he rose victorious as he grave. He came to conquer sin and death. He rose victorious over all. By the way, when you trust Christ as your Savior, you get God in you. God empowers you to have victory over your sin. You don't have to live in your sin anymore. Right. Any child of God that's living in sin is living below their credentials. Amen. The victory over sin because of what Christ has done for us. The nobleman is the Lord Jesus Christ. The servants are the redeemed. These ten servants represent everyone who's received the Lord Jesus Christ. And should be serving him. Each one who has been redeemed has been given not only life, and by the way, when you receive eternal life, it's it is eternal. That's right. It is everlasting. It cannot be lost. Thank God for that. Uh, once you're saved, you're always saved. Amen. Uh, we know that there's a lot of people who claim to be saved that sure don't act like it, however. And if you are saved, you ought to act like you're saved. 
Each one who's been given eternal life, each one who is saved, has been given, been given the gospel message. But then there's another group. Did you note the group of the citizens? So we have the noblemen. We have his servants, who each one's given a pound. We'll explain what that is in a few moments, a little bit more detail, right? And then we have these citizens, these citizens. Notice what it says there in verse 14. Everybody with me? But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. They hated the noblemen. Who are these citizens? Well, I think first application... Jewish nation. Israel rejected their Messiah. He came unto his own, his own right. received him not. I think that's obviously the first application. I, 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 we can see that relative to what specifically is going on here in the text and, and the fact that, that uh, he's going in at Palm Sunday as we recognize it. You know, uh, they laid the palm branches down. He rode on that, that colt and, and, and uh, Hosanna, uh, uh, blessed be uh, is he who comes in the name of the Lord and, and give the victory now. Uh, this most directly, this is speaking to the Jewish people. But I think if we're going to apply this to you and I today, I can't help but injury is the world at large. It is what we refer to, what the Bible refers to as the world that is opposed to God. The world that is, is, is living under the power of Satan. Right. Under the prince and power of the air, uh, the kingdom of darkness. It is, it is this, this, those who are citizens of the opposition to Christ, the opposition to heaven, those who are against the king of kings. It's hated, hated, the Bible says they hated him, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him. We will not have this man to reign over us. The world does not want Christ because the world does, is, is sold itself to its own self, to sin. We will not have this man to reign over us. This is the world. It's the lost. It's the dead in trespasses and sin. It's those who love darkness rather than John. Gospel of John chapter 3. Just to have your Bible there, probably a dozen pages thereabouts. Uh, John chapter 3, we're going to pick it up in verse 16, which many of us probably have committed to memory, but we're going to go further than that, and it's doubtful very many of us have much of the following text memorized. Notice what it says in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world. By the way, God's love is pure. There's no sin in God the point I want us to consider is this. God's love does not have an ulterior motive. Right. Amen. God loves not to get, but to give. Amen. So many times our love has a secondary motive, right? Right? God's love is pure. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, that's a nobleman in our parable. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Aren't you thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, friend, if you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, repent of your sin and by faith trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior. He'll save your soul. Amen. Amen. No matter how good or how bad you think you are, you need Christ. That's right. right. And he'll save you if you'll turn to him in repentance and faith. Verse 17 system organized against God, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. By the way, most of the world thinks that we are here to condemn it. What I mean by we, we are representatives of the kingdom. We're servants. We're going to talk about our job here in a few minutes. Some of you are a little bit ahead of me, I would suspect, aren't you? The world thinks we're against it. The world thinks we're here to condemn it. I'm not here to condemn the world. The world's condemned already. Right. God didn't come to condemn the world. The world's condemned already. Dead in trespasses and sin and in need of a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. Notice what it says in verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already 
because he hath not believed in the name of the only 20. Don't miss these two verses. This is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Amen. Can you see that from back in our text now in chapter 19? And we note there in verse verse 14, But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. They rejected him. They, right. they, they did not want him. They, they, they refused him. <clears throat> so that the point, I guess, the question I have from point one about these characters is this. In this story... Are you a servant of the nobleman, the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you a citizen of the world that despises the Lord Jesus Christ? Despises his word. Despises his commands. Yea, despises his gospel. Are you a servant or a citizen? The second thing I want us to consider this morning is found in verses 10 and 13 we've read already, and that is the commission. I want us to think, first of all, about this priceless investment. The gospel cost Jesus everything. The provision of the gospel for you and I, that you and I could receive the gift of salvation from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it cost him everything. He gave everything to give you and I eternal life. Amen. It costs, it's, it's, it's priceless. The gospel is, is priceless. You think about what it costs Christ, and you think about this as well. What is the value of a soul? You know, our souls are eternal. Your soul is the eternal you. And we spend so much of our lives concerned about the temporary us. Don't we? Uh, Pastor Lockhart talked about the perfect temperature in Sunday school this morning, and we would argue. About at least one brother that agreed with you. All right. So there's, there's one in the church. Yes. Amen. Well, I like that 60. A lot of others right now, we like it to be up in the 80s would be, be a little better. I think Brother Andy would probably be in the 60 crowd. Yeah, there you go. Not 60 years old, 60 degrees. All right. Okay. I have no idea how old Brother Andy is, but we don't want to go there. All right. I do have an idea how old he is, but I don't think he's 60 yet. All right. And 60 sounded younger all the time, by the way. So, um, yeah, there you go. Uh, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> oh, the value, the value of a soul. You think, you think about, about heaven and, and, and you think that this, our soul is eternal. That's right. We do. I would guess that most everyone in here knows what you're having for lunch today. Or at least where you're going. Some of you are going, I have no idea. Well, you, you, you probably have a parent or somebody that's taking care of that, but... But nonetheless, you do know you're going to eat today. You're concerned about what you're going to eat today. And let me tell you, tell you let me make sure I'll prove my point. Just, just suppose that the person responsible for your afternoon lunch decides to, to uh, not fulfill that responsibility today. Oh, woe is you, right? This is bad news. We're, we're concerned about us. We want the climate right. We want to be fed and so on and so forth. We, we like things our way. We're very concerned about the temporary us. We ought to be concerned about the eternal us. Your soul is forever. Was given this same investment. A pound, as we understand it, was equivalent to 100 days wages. For the average worker. So, no matter what your economic status is, 100 days labor, now we're not talking about necessarily 100 calendar days, we're talking about 100 work days. That's their, right? Would we agree with this? Right? The, the pound, so the Lord used the illustration here of a pound to get the attention of those he was talking to. This, this, uh, this was not $5. It's amazing how often the Lord used money to make illustrations because it does get our attention, doesn't it? Uh, our soul is priceless. And could you put a price on the gospel? Well, the point that the Lord was making here is this is great value. This is of, of, of great value. This is a, a, a great, great investment. A 
priceless investment, the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could you put a price on the gospel? How could we quantify it? We who believe have yet to understand the value. I, I don't know that, I, I mean, maybe it's going to take us all of eternity to get it figured out. We'll be singing his praises. And some have to say, how could we, are we going to get bored with that? I don't think so. We're going to continue to understand the value of what we've received. Amen. And boy, as we grow up in Christ's likeness and grow in our understanding of the word of God, we should grow in our valuing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And in that, we should grow in our pursuit of souls. With the gospel of Jesus Christ. I also think about not only this priceless investment, but I, I want us to see the parity indicated. We hear much today about equality and equal opportunity, don't we? We hear a lot about that. You hear that in the news. Uh, things You hear people talking about it. Uh, equality, equal opportunity. You know, we... we we must understand that what is being broadcast as equal opportunity, or what is equal opportunity, does not mean equal results. That's right. Let me back up and say that again because I want to make sure we, we get that, right? And God gives everyone equal opportunity. That's right. But that doesn't mean we're all going to experience the same result. Is there anyone in here that questions whether or not God has given every soul an equal opportunity to receive Christ? That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Amen. God is a God of equal opportunity. But that doesn't mean we're all going to experience equal results. It makes all the difference right. in the results you experience with God or against God. The nobleman it's interesting let me make one more statement here about equality so much of what we hear today in the name of equality is not intended to be equal but I would say is rather mutual most people say equality 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 that means we do well, no it's equal opportunity it doesn't mean equal equal results it's interesting to note in our account here in this story that as we read on, notice what it says here in verse 16. Uh, as we're, we have the accounting time here, all right? Everybody there in verse 16? Then came the first, the first servant, who had been given what? Each servant had been given one pound. Everybody with me here? So make sure we're on the same page, understand what's going on. Each servant had been given one pound. And then we have the account here, the counting of three of them. Notice what it says in verse 16. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful to very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. Right? So it's interesting to note this. This is something I, I just, just stood out to me. That the Lord did not take from the one who had two. Right. The Lord did not take the excess from the one who gained ten pounds and the one who gained five pounds say, let's take those extra from them and give to this lazy one over here. No, he praised them and said, well done. Amen. Every child of God should want to hear well done when we stand before the Amen. Lord. In fact, the Lord judged the lazy one. The Lord judged the lazy one. What was the problem? And we're going to look at this lazy one in a, few, in a little bit more detail here. But let, let me just help us answer this question here. What was the problem with the lazy one? Invested. Gave ten. The second one we're told about invested and gave five. You know what the problem with the last one was? He didn't invest. Read on. I'll prove it. And he said, uh, verse 20, And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I had kept laid up in a napkin, for I feared thee. And he goes on to say it's all the Lord's fault that he didn't produce anything. 
Which, by the way, it isn't. Right. It's not the Lord's fault. God is good. Amen. It's not God's fault. Right. Amen. By the way, a lot of us would do better with our children that are uh, straying if we confess our sin to God. That's right. There's not a perfect parent in the building. That's right. Amen. And you may be far superior than any other parent in the building, but you still have made, made errors. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The problem with the, the third servant we're told about here was not that, that he, he didn't invest. That's right. He didn't invest. He hid it in a napkin. He hid it in a napkin. It, it's a, the, the, the light that was hidden under a bushel is described by another place by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What are you doing with the investment of God? Listen, it's the investment of God in you. Occupy till I come. And friend, he is coming again. Amen. I want us to see thirdly, we not only see the characters in the commission, but I want us to consider the counting. Keep your place here in Luke. Let's go back to Mark 16, would you? Would you do that? Let's turn back there to Mark chapter 16. When we think about counting, and the, 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 the thought I want us to think about is the fact that, that we are going to give an account someday to God. And by the way, God keeps impeccable records. Now, no one's going to stand before God and argue about his judgment. That's right. All right well, you may fuss with God on, in this life, but you won't be arguing when you stand before God. Whether it be the Bema Seat, the Judgment Seat of Christ, as we call it, ever judgment you arrive at when you enter eternity, you will not be arguing with the judge. Okay. You won't. There will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth at the great white throne judgment, not because the judge did anything wrong, because of the reality that those who are there have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's right. Uh, the Bible also describes that there are going to be those that stand before the judgment seat who will suffer great loss. I think some argue about will, will there be tears shed and so on. I think there probably will be. And the fact of the matter is all of us have fallen short of what we could be That's for right. God as his children. That's right. Uh, but we desire a well done. We desire a well done. Nonetheless, I want us to go back here now and think about this counting. So we think about, notice what it says here in verse 15 of Matthew 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're going to read another verse here, but I want us, I want, let's, let's, let's tie this into our message this morning. Everybody with me? So go ye. So the nobleman is saying to the servants, Go ye into all the world and invest the pounds that I have given you. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It's a long time. Is everybody with me here? Right. Isn't that what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. That's the, 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 the parable of the pounds is what we're talking about. God, the nobleman, has invested in his servants the gospel, and he has invested that in us, and we are to take it and invest it in others. Go ye into all the world and invest your pound. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. I don't like to think about, talk about. I do like the results that come from proclaiming the truth about heaven. Hell is a horrible, horrible place. That's right. And this word uh, damned here is speaking about those who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and will spend an eternity in damnation, a place prepared for the devil and his angels. That's right. Hell is more awful, more terrible, 
than anyone could possibly paint a picture of. And I know they can do amazing things in Hollywood and painting pictures with things. They, they cannot do justice to the torments of hell. That's right. no, 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 uh, no picture, no, no preacher, no writer, no artist could possibly depict the awfulness of hell. Those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ will spend eternity separated from God. They have not believed. But I want us to see an important point here, and we're not saved by works, are we? We're saved by faith. I want us to, let me read verse 16 again. I, was, I want to answer a question, but I also want to make a point. All right? Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. What is missing in the second half of the verse? See, in the first half of the verse, there are those who think that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. That's what they believe. But we're not saved by works. No, baptism is an identifier. See, the latter half of the verse doesn't say those who don't believe and don't get baptized will be damned. Why is that left off? What, what's the point? Why did the Lord even, why is the word baptized in there? Because baptism is evidence of faith. Right. We shall know them by their fruits. God knows your heart. Amen. God knows my heart. But our following the woman declares our faith, our loyalty. Amen. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? All right. So let's go back over to, to Luke 19. I want to try to finish this up. So, according to verse 14, you're either saved or lost. You're either a citizen of heaven or a citizen of this world. You're a servant of the Lord or a citizen of, of this world. You're either saved or lost. There's, there's no place in between. If you're lost, you can be saved. If you are lost, you can be saved. And anybody's told you you're lost and can't be saved is a liar. Right. If you're lost, you can be saved. Here's another truth. If you're saved, you cannot be lost. Amen. 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 If you're lost, you can be saved. It's your choice. If I could choose for you, I would. Every parent, my parent would choose for their grandchild. Amen. But salvation is a personal choice. If you're lost, you can be saved. But listen, friend, I have great news. If you're a child of God, you cannot be lost. Amen. Doesn't mean you can't stray. Doesn't mean you can't be wayward. Doesn't mean you can't be a, be a prodigal. Doesn't mean there won't be scars for those seasons in your life. But you can return to the Father. Amen. You can return to the Father and you can be restored. Amen. And you should. Our world is against Christ. They're dead in trespasses and sins. But you know, miracles, miracles do happen. You get down in the dumps about what's going on in our world. You get frustrated about a lack of fruitfulness. Like, man, what are we doing? Why are we not seeing more people say now listen to the question before you raise your hand or don't raise your hand. How many of you rejected the gospel at least one time before you got saved? How many of you here rejected the gospel? And you're saved, but you rejected the gospel at least one time before you got saved. Do you see that you're a miracle? Some of you rejected the gospel for years. Years. I, I know the testimony of some of you, us in here. You rejected the gospel for years. Some of you threw tracks away, made fun, and, and right. uh, ran, the, ran the soul winner off. Every one of those hands that went up is a miracle. By the way, if you're saved, it's a miracle. I'm saying yeah. it's a miracle yeah. upon a miracle that those who... Let me ask the question a different way. And, well, I'm sure hard cases that we've seen one. Amen. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to have you admit that you're a hard case or not. That might be difficult for some to admit, but, but some of us, God had chased us for a while, and he used a lot of his servants to chase us. Amen? Yes? Aren't you thankful they stayed after it? Aren't you thankful they continued to invest their pound? Amen. Praise God for that. We see, as I mentioned already, both the saved and the lost are going to give an account. In verse 15, we see the accounting of the, the servants. That's the judgment seat of Christ. For your faithfulness, your usefulness to the expansion of the kingdom of God. Right. The number of cars you had, how nice the house you had, how far you advanced in your career. 
I don't think you're going to be judged for it. That, that's not really going to matter at the judgment seat of Christ unless we use those things for the advancement of the kingdom of God. That's right. Look, God has given us all things richly to enjoy. I'm not trying to throw shade on anybody that's enjoying the blessing of God. Thank God for his blessing. That's right. But we need to have our priorities in order as God's people. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Verse 27. Let's just skip ahead there. Shall we for sake of time? But those mine enemies, that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Now, this is a parable. So what's the, the truth? What's the precept being taught in this parable? The great white throne judgment is for real. That's right. And those who reject God will be cast in the lake of fire. That's right. Forever. Forever. The pound that God has invested into each of us who are his servants. How could you put, the, put, a, put a price on a soul? You think about what it costs God to provide that opportunity for us. It's, it's, how could you put a price on that? We need to invest that pound that's been entrusted to us for the glory of God. For the expansion of God's kingdom. How would you value what God has entrusted to you? I don't know that we could. You know, we need to get busy again serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People of Jesus Christ need to be busy serving the Lord. Amen. He's invested in us this pound, as is used in our illustration, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He is worthy. Jesus is worthy of the reward of his suffering. And what is that reward? That reward is souls. And that reward is the faithfulness of souls who have received him to serve him. We're his servants. And soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Amen. That day is coming. Whether by the rapture or by, as we say, the undertaker, soon we'll all be with the Lord. Or we'll all be separated from him for all eternity. My friend, what have you done with the gospel? Have you received the gospel? Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? You know, as I think about so many people who don't indicate that fruitfulness in Mark chapter 16, as we read there, we're talking about a baptism being an identifier with Christ. I had this thought yesterday as I was pondering this. Let me, let me just read it for you. May every child of God live so that everyone around us knows whose we are. And so that everyone knows where we are when we depart. As a child of God, my life needs to be lived in such a way so that everyone around me knows whose I am, who I belong to. And so that when I depart this life, there would be no question in anyone's mind where I am. May our lives be lived to bring him on remains. Perhaps we as God's people need to hit the reset button this morning and rededicate ourselves to, to being faithful to God with the inheritance he's given to us. Perhaps you're here today and, and you've been playing games with God. Perhaps everybody in the room thinks you're a child of God, but you know you're not. There's never been a time in your life where you personally received Christ as your Savior. My soul, my soul friend, come and give your life to God. Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Perhaps you are saved. You know you're saved, but you've wandered from God. Come back to God today. Amen. Come back to Him today. You say, well, preacher, my life's a mess. I've done this, done that. It, it'd be a mess. If I come back, it's spaghetti. God is in the miracle working business. Amen. He can begin to sort that spaghetti out in your life. Say, I'm too far gone. You're not too far gone. That's right. What are you doing with the investment of God to you? God's invested the gospel to every soul. Have you received it? We who have received it, God's invested the message of the gospel in us. What are we doing with that message? Occupy till I come. Be busy about my business, take care of my business until I return.
That's what the Lord has commanded us to do. That's not just for the disciples and those that heard him that day before he went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as we celebrate today. That command is given to every child of God. Let's be busy about the master's business. Let's have heads bowed and eyes here today and you say, Pastor, Preacher, I'm not all I should be, but I am thankful that I have received the gift of eternal life. I know I'm a child of God. I know it. It's set in my heart. I know I'm a believer. Would you hold your hand up? Testimony, hands all over the room. Praise the Lord for that. Wonderfully, you may take them down. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty this morning. How many of you who just raised your hand need to hit what we would call the reset button? getting our priorities in order, making sure that we're investing the pound that God has entrusted to us as we should. Don't raise your hand, but be honest before the Lord. It's so easy for us to get sidetracked, to creep in and take over. We're not busy about the master's business. We're not occupying until he comes. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And you need to hit the reset button in your personal testimony, your personal witness. Ask the Lord to give you fruit. Let's be good servants, not servants that take and hide the pound and never tell anybody about it. Perhaps you're here today and you couldn't raise your hand earlier, or you did raise your hand, but in your heart of hearts, you, you might think uh, I'm too far gone, or you might be thinking there's people here that think I'm saved and that wouldn't go well I want you to know friend no matter what you may be thinking right now about any kind of pressure that would be on you for trusting Christ there would be no pressure from anyone in this room everyone in this room would, would be thrilled if you trusted Christ as your savior if you got that settled you can come today and be saved friend that decision is yours it's a personal decision if you're here today and you say, Preacher, I've got some questions about whether or not I, I know Christ. I've got some questions about whether or not I'm saved. Are you concerned? You know, it's heaven or hell, friend. There is no in-between. It's one or the other. Anybody like that this morning say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you lift your hand up so I'd be aware of your concern? Anybody like that at all? All right, let's stand together, shall we, church? Father, thank you for our time and your word today. Lord, thank you for the gospel priceless thank you for this life and Lord thank you for those of us who have investment that you've entrusted to us Lord help us to go and invest in others help us to be busy about your business help us to occupy Lord till you return for us or you call us home help us to be faithful to you Lord we would desire to return multiple fold in another parable, you talked about some 30, 40, or even 100 fold. Lord, help us to be busy about reaching people with the gospel of Christ. Work on invitation time, Lord. If there's folk you've spoken to about rededicating, resetting their lives, getting some things right with you today, whatever the need may be, Lord, I pray we'd flood these altars this morning, seeking you, seeking your power and presence in our lives, that your kingdom would be advancing in our time. We'd not just be treading water. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We'll sing.